Well, we have two readings this morning, and if you've picked up a Bible or been given a Bible as you've come in, um, you, I'll give the page number, uh, as I usually do in any case, and uh, that'll get us to the right place. We're going to Acts chapter 2, the page number uh, is uh, page uh, 1097, 1097. It is now 50 days since Jesus returned to heaven uh, and it's um, Jerusalem is packed full of people for the um, feast that is called uh, Pentecost uh, and this Jewish feast God chooses and Christ chooses to pour out his Holy Spirit upon the little group of 11 men that he had chosen and that he trained and equipped and of course Matthias uh, is with him by this stage as well who's been added to the number to replace Judas and Christ pours out his Holy Spirit upon them and um, they end up speaking in the languages of all the people that are there so if you were from um, Asia and you spoke a particular dialect of Greek or whatever, you would have heard them speaking in your native tongue. And uh, the crowd of people began to think, these people are out of their minds, they're drunk. They've had too much wine, but it's only nine o'clock in the morning. And so uh, they realize it's too early in the day for anybody to be drunk. And so Peter then gets up to explain what has happened. And we want to read uh, from verse 22 Page 1097, Acts 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, or fellow Jews, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then we move th forward to verse 32 where he takes up his resurrection of, Je of Jesus again. This Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, that means turn around, and be baptized every one of you into the name of Jesus Christ as the sign of the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself and with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying be saved or save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls or people. And then we turn forward to Acts chapter 8. And this is page uh, 1104. 1104, Acts chapter 8. 
and we want to read from verse 26. And now this is outside Jerusalem. This is in the other group of people, the Samaritans. And you may have heard of the story of the Good Samaritan. And the Jews and the Samaritans didn't like each other. But here now Philip is down preaching in Samaria, the same message. And then we read of what the Lord says to him about an individual. Verse 26, page 1104. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise up and go towards the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he arose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go close and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard the man, the eunuch, reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself? Or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Behold! Here is water, or literally it is, behold, water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the child to stop, and they went down to the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And then when they came up from the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. Amen. So we want to look at these verses uh, together from Acts uh, chapter 8. And um, the theme that I want to take from our readings this morning is baptized and added to the church. Baptized and added to the church. Today is a very significant day in the life of our congregation and it is even more significant in the lives of Christopher and Tonya as they are baptised and uh, on the uh, profession of their faith in Christ added to the church. And we want all together to explore the significance of what is happening today from the Word of God and I think we can do that helpfully from the two passages that we've read this morning focusing mostly on Acts chapter 8 the story of the Ethiopian man now it's maybe important for us to realize where Ethiopia is it's not quite the Ethiopia that we know today uh, although it does go that far down but if you think of Ethiopia so it's down here along the Nile. It's really northern Sudan. Northern Sudan. And spilling a little uh, further into what we today would call Ethiopia. And uh, this man, uh, we want to think about uh, what the kind of man he was. His background. We want to think about his beliefs. And then we want to think thirdly about his baptism. 
So let's think first of all about the background of this man. As I've said, he resides in Ethiopia, uh, this place that is really the equivalent of northern Sudan and then spreading sideways into um, modern day Ethiopia. And we see here that he is a man of great authority. There's probably people in our lives who are people of great authority. In your place of work, you'll have someone above you and they're the boss. Uh, or uh, he or she, and they have great authority. Uh, you young people at school or university, there will be uh, a principal, uh, there will be a head of your faculty, and they have great authority. They decide who enters the school, who comes to this university or college, and they decide um, uh, uh, much about the life of the school. Well, this man had great authority in himself. And he had that because he worked in the court of the queen of this region where he came from. Uh, he was, in fact, the treasurer or the finance minister. If you think of Stormont, we've got a finance minister. Well, he was the equivalent uh, of uh, the finance minister in Stormont. So he's a very important man, he's lots of responsibility, he looks after the, the finances, not just of a family, but of the whole nation. But we're told something else at the end of verse 27, which is very unusual about this man. He had come to Jerusalem to worship God. Now, it's not that there are not gods in Ethiopia to worship. They have their own gods. And so this man could have engaged in worship in Ethiopia. But this man deliberately comes to this place called Jerusalem. The place that the scriptures of the Old Testament focus on. The place to which Jesus came and the place in which Jesus died. And he comes to Jerusalem. And in coming to Jerusalem he's actually doing something very significant. He's saying, I don't believe the gods that my family and friends and my countrymen worship, that they are real gods and true gods and living gods. They're only gods that people imagine. But in going to Jerusalem, the God that is there from the Old Testament, we're taught, is the God who made the heavens and the earth. And the God who has always been at work in his world, he is one God, but actually within that one God, and this is really difficult to understand, but we can accept it without understanding it. Within that one God, there is God the Father, God the Son, Christ, God the Holy Spirit. So this man is saying, this is the true God. He is the God I am to worship and to serve. And of course, therein comes a challenge for all of us today. There are so many gods in the nations of the earth today. And there's so many gods in any one nation. In our own nation, uh, or nations, if you want to call, we refer to the whole of this um, area where we call the British Isles, um, UK and Ireland. And... Uh, people, yes, there's a general belief and commitment to the Christian God, the God of the Bible. But then people worship sport. People worship uh, their families. That's all that matters. My family comes first. That's what I live for. People will say to you, well, actually, it's my work. And sometimes when people retire, they have no sense of who they are any longer because they've lost who they were, their identity. And uh, we could add on to that uh, music and the pop stars and all the, the people that are held up before us today. And many people find their meaning in life from either following them or following a football team or uh, caring for their family. And those things, when we put them before God, they're not wrong in themselves. But if we put them before God, the Bible says, 
That's an idol. And none of those things can save us. None of those things can help us when we're ill. None of those things can change our lives when we feel um, that we don't know who we are and we're lost and everything we've tried in life doesn't give us satisfaction. So this man is saying to us, there is nonetheless a true God who is to be worshipped. And he is worshipping him in Jerusalem, as we see here in verse 27. And he's now coming back from Jerusalem, and he's travelling on a road. Jerusalem, if you imagine this being the land of Canaan, Jerusalem to sort of cross here, and you've got the Mediterranean Sea coming down here, and this man's going down here, but there's a road that runs from Jerusalem down to Gaza, down to the coast. And that's the road that he's travelling on. And then he'll take this road down here. And it's a main road. But it's a road, as we'll see in a moment, that there's not many people on. And that's probably why he's chosen that road. It seems a bit strange to go across there and down here to get to here. Why would he not go straight down? Well, he wants to read. He wants to read. And maybe some of us, we read in the bus. We read in the car. We get a new book. And sometimes our children can't wait till they get the book opened. Well, that's what's happened to this man. Because he's been in Jerusalem and he's got a new part of the Bible. He's got this book called Isaiah. And Isaiah is the equivalent of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in the Old Testament. Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are the New Testament gospel writers. And Isaiah is the equivalent in the Old Testament. He's the gospel writer. And so the man is reading, um, and he's able to, the, the child's able to travel at a slow pace, and he's able to take his time, and he's reading, and he's thinking about what he's reading. Uh, verse 28, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. So his background is, he's left the false gods, he's come to the God of the Jews, the God who is worshipped and found in Jerusalem, the God who is revealed in Isaiah. But then we see something else. We see that this man does not understand what he's reading. Look at verse uh, 30 where Philip, and we'll talk about Philip in a moment, asks the question, do you understand what you're reading? Maybe sometimes we're reading something uh, it could be at school, maybe it's in another language, talking to our son Mark yesterday, he's in Germany, and he's trying to improve his German, he said, I'm reading a reading book by an eight-year-old, and he says, maybe I've started too far on. He's struggling. Uh, he speaks German very well, but he's wanting to learn to read German better. And this man wants to read the scriptures, but he doesn't understand them. And... Then, look at what he says in verse 31. How can I unless someone guides me? And he urged Philip to come up and sit with him. And that teaches us something very, very important also about this man that's relevant for us today as well. That he is teachable. He's teachable. And he's submissive. He wants to hear what God's word is saying. It's not enough that he reads it himself. He needs someone to be his teacher. And young people know in school that when you come to learn maths or French or German, you need someone to teach you. You can't learn yourself. And men and women, it's exactly the same with the Christian faith. And knowing God, the God who made the world and the God of the Bible, we need people to teach us. And that's my role. I'm not somebody way up there in a big pedestal. I'm just one amongst the rest of the church, but God has called me to teach, to explain, and to show people, here's what God says to us. And here's what God requires of us. And in the same way as God gives people gifts to be an engineer, to be a doctor, to be a policeman, to be a teacher, God gives gifts to the church, to men, to teach. But you see, as you young people will know, if you've got a good teacher, 
you also need good pupils. You need good learners. You need people who will come into class and who will sit and get their books out and listen and engage with the teacher. And that's exactly what this man is saying. I am ready to engage. I'm ready to be taught. I'm submissive. But I don't have anybody at this moment in time to teach me. And so God has sent Philip to come alongside this man. And the chariot is going slow enough that Philip can actually run alongside the chariot and talk to him at the same time. A bit like a jogger that you see along our roads. And the man invites Philip to come up and to teach him. That's his background. And men and women and young people, how important and significant this man's background is. The progress that he's made, the point at which he's come, where he realizes there are false gods and there's a true God. And I need to find the true God. And I need to go where he is made known. I need to go to church. And I need to be under someone who will teach me. Um, yes, I can read the scriptures for myself, but God has given teachers. And men and women and young people, that's so important in our lives as well. I'm sometimes struck when I'm out uh, doing outreach. I'm only here about six months in Enniskillen, but I was 17 years in Carrick Ferguson. We did a lot of work in a market on a Thursday. And um, over the years, uh, it was a great opportunity, but over the years of being in Carrick Fergus, I'm struck by people who say, the Bible is not true. And Christopher and Tonya thought that at one stage. Just fairy stories. And then you say to them, have you read the Bible? No. Well, how can you say something isn't true if you haven't read it and thought about it and engaged with it? And it only strikes me that people are willing to, we're, by our sinful nature, we're willing to engage with anything other than the truth, the truth as God presents it. So his background, and may this be our background, may this be your background as well. But then let's notice secondly, his belief, his belief. And we've touched on this uh, already, his belief. We've noted that he has a belief in the one God, the creator God, the God who deals with people's sins. And he's going up to Jerusalem and you see he's there. And in Jerusalem, this special building, this was, if you want to call it this, it was the cathedral of Judaism. Uh, and maybe that's not even a big enough uh, concept to, to convey. Um, uh, for what it, the significance of this building. But this was the place where um, every day, morning and evening, an animal, a lamb was taken and it was killed. Now that might seem to us, it's not, not a cruel thing to do. And yes, if people go out uh, killing lambs without a purpose or animals without a purpose, that is a cruel thing to do and we shouldn't do that. But the killing of this lamb and these lambs, God had asked them to do it because God, until Jesus came, had to provide a way to cover over the sin. And so he said, as blood is shed, the blood of the animal, then I will look away from that sin and I will not punish it of those who are offering this and saying, I look to you, God, to take away my sin. And this lamb, you see, had pointed forward to the lamb that we read of in Isaiah 53. And here now in Acts chapter 8, because this is the passage that this man is reading. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And uh, as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Verses 32 and 33. And this Ethiopian man realizes this is not talking about an animal any longer. This is talking about a human being. This is talking about a man who was 
um, treated like a sheep and was put to death even though he had done nothing wrong and he was denied justice. We know in Northern Ireland what it is for people to feel that they've been denied justice. Um, it happens sometimes when we're applying for a job. We're denied justice. Somebody else who has a word in somebody else's ear, they get the job or they're known. And, or it can be when we're being dealt with by the police uh, or the, the, the powers that be, where we're stopped in our car and we're accused of doing something that we haven't done. And we feel justice is denied to us. Or maybe in school, some other boy or girl gets you into trouble. Uh, and uh, they're the one that has done the wrong, but they set you up. And the teacher believes them, not you. Or maybe they're treating you badly at school and the teacher believes them, not you. And you're denied justice. It's a really painful thing when people are denied justice. And God is the God of justice. But here he allows Jesus to be denied what was fair. He would have no sin, no wrong. He did not deserve to die. But here now he dies. That's what this man is reading. He dies for others. He dies for the sins of others. And so the man says, I don't understand who this is. And, and the Philip then, who already knows about Jesus, the Jesus that had walked into Jerusalem many times, the Jesus who had gone in in that final week, Passion Week as we call it, and had um, um, offered his life on the cross outside Jerusalem. And so what does Philip do? Verse 35, really significant. Philip opened his mouth. And beginning at this scripture, he didn't say, now forget about Isaiah for a moment. I want to take you to another scripture. This is a better scripture. No, he began at that scripture and he preached or he told him the good news. Literally it is. The word here means to share good news. He shared the good news of Jesus with him. And so the man's belief begins to deepen. It begins to change. He now realizes all those sacrifices, those animals that I saw being offered in Jerusalem when I was there a few hours ago, they're not needed any longer. Because the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Christ of God, has come and lived as Jesus, the man Jesus of Nazareth. And he has gone to the cross and he has offered his life to take away my sin. To make me right with God. To give me peace and joy and purpose in life. And so his whole belief deepens and develops and changes. And men and women, I often say to people, life is a journey. It's a journey. And God is driving the bus. And there are points in our lives, in the journey, where God deals with us and he brings us to a certain degree of knowledge. So if you talk to Christopher and Tonya, they'll tell you that, um, Tonya will tell you that she always believed there was a God. That was an important milestone in her life. And then you'll talk to Christopher and he'll tell you about how he did um, RE at school. Mark's Gospel. I've taught it to children at school um, who wanted to do RE. It's still the key book. And Christopher will tell you, I got an A in my RE, but I didn't know the Gospel. He did well, didn't he? He did well. But he didn't know the Gospel. That's what he told me. But you see, that was an important milestone. Because now that Christopher does know the Gospel and does know Christ, all that knowledge that he was given at that time just comes into play. 
So God is the driver, if you want to be like this, of a bus. And we are passengers and there's a journey and he stops the bus at certain points and he deals with us. And that's what he's doing with this Ethiopian eunuch. He's now dealing with him in a final and fullest way to bring him to know him, to know God, to in Jesus Christ personally and individually. And what the Bible describes as savingly. Now to save someone is to rescue them. We've got a fire and rescue service. And the fire breaks out in your house and you're caught in the upstairs room. And the fireman comes in and he saves you, he rescues you from physical death. Well, that's what Jesus does in <coughs> spiritual death. It's hell he rescues us from, from our sins. And he says, I died for your sins. Allow me to rescue you. Allow me to put my arms around you and to take you to myself and to take you to my Father that you belong to the family of God. See, being a Christian is not a nice tie, buttoned up, three-piece suit, and um, all nice, prim and proper, and you don't do this and this and this and this and this, and you do this, this and this and this and this. No, being a Christian, first and foremost, is knowing that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and that he is rescuing me from my sin, which separates me from God. And that's the belief this man comes to. And for all of us here today, Christopher and Tonya have come to that point where now God and Christ has embraced them. And today they're going to, as we come in a moment, to talk about baptism. That's the sign of this. And for all of you here today, I want you to think about life being a journey. And where's been the bus stops in your life so far? And what has God been saying to you at those bus stops? And perhaps you're at the point as Christopher was certainly at, where just life was broken in a total mess. Having been for the kindness of his father, Christopher said to me, he wouldn't be here today. The doctor, seeing his results, said, you should be dead, seeing the liver results. But you see, God kept his life, or kept his hand in Christopher's life. That's ten years ago. Christopher didn't come to Christ at that point. His father, his mother cared for him, got him back into health and strength. And then Christopher began to give you that big question, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? What is life about? And brethren, those are the issues that matter. Not how many thousand pounds we have in the bank. Not have we reached the top of our profession. Not do I drive the newest car, or do I have the flashiest holidays, or do I get A stars in all my GCSEs, uh, or come out of the first class degree, or whatever. What matters is, who am I? Why am I here? Where did I come from? What happens after death? And those are issues that we need to grapple with. And God stops the bus at various points. And a year ago, just over a year ago, he stopped it finally for Christopher after he had done much thinking and looked at different religions, looked even at um, the occult. And uh, could that be the place of meaning? And Antonia, likewise, asking the question, what is life about? And God, having brought the two of them together then, and they're bouncing these questions off each other. What do you think? Do you believe the Bible? That's, that's, the, language, that's the level of their, their relationship. What a wonderful thing. Out for walks and talking about these things together. And God working in each of them. And bringing each of them individually because the journey to faith is individual. It's not one size fits all. God deals with us as individuals because we're individuals made in his image. And he cares for each one of us as individuals as we sang in our opening psalm. And so he brings Christopher and Tonya 
into his embracing love and care in Christ. And that's what he's doing with this man. And I say to you, all of us here this morning, if you don't know God in that way, will you please think about it? Will you please think about it? Don't dismiss the Bible as a load of fairy tales. Get it out and read it. There was a great preacher once, and he was saying, he was asked the question, would you please defend the Bible? And he says, yes, I will. He says, it's like a lion. Let it loose. Let the Bible loose. And when we let the Bible loose in our lives, it's like a lion. It does its own work. You don't need to defend it. It defends itself. And that's where Christopher and Tonya came to. This is none other than the word of God for us. And that's the same. God offers the same to every one of us. There's not a single person in this room this morning that he says to you, no, no, it's not on offer to you. Indeed, God commands all men everywhere to come to Jesus. And he brings us in his time. Let's think then thirdly about his baptism. Because now we see um, they're traveling and the man is understood. He's, uh, Jesus has been preached to him. Uh, we're not told everything in the conversation. We're told the key points. But like when young people come home from school, how was your day? Oh, um, rowing was fun today. Or whatever was fun today. Uh, I enjoyed my German class. Uh, I got um, extra work because I forgot my physics book. But they don't hear from 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so it's the same with scripture. We don't hear every detail. We get the salient points. And look now at verse 36. As they went down the roads, they're talking away down the road. And do you hear what the... Uh, what we're told then, um, as they went down the road, they came to a lake, a waterfall. No, they came to some, some water. Remember, this is a desert road. You're not going to find a lake. You're not going to find a river. You're not going to find a waterfall in a desert, ro desert road. You're going to find a little... Um, thing bubbling up out of the ground uh, where there's water uh, that's what you're going to find in the desert potentially and um, obviously the um, <laughs> Philip has been talking to this man about baptism and about what it means and you see baptism doesn't make anyone a Christian doesn't make anyone a Christian baptism is God saying to someone who is a Christian here is my sign of my love for you. It's a bit like I wear a wedding ring. Because I say it's the same sign to my wife. Here is my love for you. And baptism and the Lord's Supper, which we're coming to next week, are the signs and the seals of God's love for you, Christopher and Tonya. As those who've been saved by him. Saved baptized, added to the church. That's the pattern for adults. And then the children of the adult who believes are also to be baptized as we read there in Acts chapter 2. But that's something for another day. And the point is this man now understands that he needs to be baptized and they come to some water and look at what the eunuch says. Behold! Now, that's the equivalent of saying, look out. So, if my wife says to me, and as I'm driving the car, look out. It means there's somebody coming somewhere that's going to drive right into me, or I'm going to drive right into them, because I haven't seen them, I haven't expected them. And so when the eunuch says, this Ethiopian says, look out. He's not expecting to find water. But in God's providence, they find enough water for water to be poured or sprinkled on this man as the sign, the wedding ring of God's love for uh, them. And that's really important. 
Because when we become Christians, it's not, oh, everything's smooth and plain and we're coasting along in fifth gear in life and the wind is in our back and the sun's in our face and everything is jolly for the rest of our lives. We live happily ever after. That's not what the Christian life is about. And you see, there's many challenges, there's many twists and turns, there's many hills to be climbed, there's many pitfalls to be avoided. Uh, and when the, we are in the midst of those difficult times, the Christian can then think, actually, am I really a Christian? Is God really with me? And that's when we need to remember the wedding ring, the baptism. There's been times I've been away from home, sometimes for a couple of weeks um, with, because of my work. And um, my wife will hold on to the fact that I have given her a wedding ring. And she'll look at a photograph and it'll remind her, yes, I am married, he will come home. Um, and the baptism reminds you, Christopher and Tonya, you belong to the family of God and he will bring you home. He'll bring you home in his time. How wonderful, how wonderful that we have this sign. And this man is given this sign um, by Philip then. They get out of the chariot. Um, the translations here are not particularly good because it says they went down into, the, the, the word uh, literally is went down to. They had to get down to the chariot. They had to get down to where the water was. And um, as Christopher and Tonya are going to do, I have to do because they're taller than I am, they're going to have to get down on their knees. And I'm going to have to... <laughs> So there's all of, and then they got up and they came back. But suddenly Philip is no longer there. Because God has done his work in the life of the Ethiopian. And this man will now go back to Ethiopia, this area that we talked about. And he will be part of the church there. He was one of the first members. There may have been others there already. Because there was a great crowd of Jews in Jerusalem in the days of Pentecost from all over the known world. And I'm fairly sure Ethiopia is mentioned in that list. And so he goes and he finds, we're not told the rest of the story, but we know from Acts chapter 2 that those are saved and baptized. They are added to the church. They join the church. And that's what Christopher and Tonya are doing today. That's what I did. Uh, I was converted in my early teens and uh, really uh, I would say I didn't draw, I, di I joined what wasn't a true church. Um, it was the church of my birth, my church of my upbringing, it was a Presbyterian church. It wasn't a church where the gospel was preached, I was there for, um, I was, uh, until I was about 18 years of age. It was then when I went to Belfast to study that God brought me into contact with this denomination and I joined subsequently the true part of the true church, added to a church that's real and living where Christ is. So this man, his background, this man, his belief, and this man, his baptism, and how wonderful it would be if as a result of God's dealing with those of you who are here this morning and the stopping points and the journey of life at some point uh, all of you come to the same point as Christopher and Tonya where you know the arms of Jesus Christ like the arms of a mother or father holding you tight <coughs> so not that you are squirming to get out and get away but in a way that you know you're secure you're loved and you're precious and how wonderful that would be and the day would come when you too would be baptized amen <coughs>